Good afternoon and welcome to our presentation for Boost, the personal budgeting app. My name is Lorna and before I started at Makers and Compare the Market, I was working in social care, helping people at risk of homelessness. A recurring feature in people's lives was difficulty budgeting their income against their outgoings. Next slide, please. This is a very common situation in the UK, according to the 2018 Financial Capability Survey by the Money and Pension Service. 63% of people feel that they can't determine what happens in their lives when it comes to money. 21% of people rarely or never save, while 17% often use a credit card, overdraft or borrowing for food and bills. Our app helps people take back control of the discretionary spending by keeping tabs on their leftover money, down to a daily reckoner to help avoid overspending. Our striking colour scheme was selected using colour psychology to represent optimism and wisdom. However, parallels to various Cadbury's product branding were hard to ignore. Making the apps no picnic, but we didn't fudge it. So be a dream and give our, bootstrap, our boot, Boost app a twirl. I'll now hand over to Giorgio, who will tell you about the planning. Thank you, Lorna. We knew that this project that this project would heavily rely on planning and organisation, as all good projects do. Therefore, we dedicated the first day of our sprint to planning. The advantages to this would be that our basic understanding of the app were mutual throughout the whole team and we had a clear perception of how our end product would look. We started by, decide on an, by deciding on a minimal viable product, which included the tracking of spend, spends, which involved create, read, update and delete features, which would be communicated to our database via our web app. Our first task was to write five user stories, which were recorded on Trello. This gave us a clear indication of the specificity of features to include, as this was an essential part of our organising of organising our programming partners, so that it was clear what each pair was working on, and if we had any tasks that were outstanding or finished. One of the features was we, unan we unanimously decided to leave out was our MVP and to of our MVP and to include it later in our nice to have features. This was the ability to sign up and log in. This is due to the fact that it didn't affect how the app functions and it, as it wasn't a necessity in terms of minimal features and would only add complexity when building the core technology of the app. Following from writing our user stories, we diagrammed the UI in Balsamic, which gave us the same level of visual understanding. A pivotal part of our organization was using the agile technique of planning poker to decide the complexity of each task. We set up a project wiki to document the project as well as dev diaries and Miro boards for our retros. We mobbed the initial setup together. This was so that we all had the same starting point with GitHub repos and tools. This also helped everyone fully understand the starting point of the app development, and we were very conscious of meeting regularly to, re to review and merge pull requests, which made the process much smoother when implementing features. I'll now pass you over to Christoph, who will talk about the tech. Thank you, Georgia. And so, yes, I'd like to talk to you all about the tech we've used and specifically about the tech stack and how we've applied it. So the tech stack we chose was MERN, which stands for MongoDB, Express, JavaScript, React, JavaScript, and Node.js. And so on the next slide, I'm going to show you how that links into what we actually deployed. So we've used MongoDB to create our database. And we've used Node.js to create our backend, AP, backend app on top of which the Express.js helped us to create API endpoints. And then as a separate standing app, we've created our front end with React.js. Mm -hmm. On the next slide, I'm gonna be talking about some additional tools. As for example, we've used Bcrypt to hash all the user sensitive information so that we have that extra layer, layer of security on our database. And then, next slide please. Why we actually chose MERN? Well, we had some exposure to this, at least in on an infant with an infancy level of entry. And so we felt like we want to give it a go. We want to get better with it. We also thought it would be a great idea to explore it because all of us will be touching upon it in our play on our placement. And at the end of the day, MERN gave us ability to work within a full stack environment, which allowed us to get, gain a broader perspective on the entire on, on, on how the development process works. With that, there came so advantages and disadvantages. It was certainly good for us to have it with MERN as it allowed to separate the concerns, especially with the backend app and the front-end app. Then it also <coughs> helped us to keep consistency within the language, as the core language of all of them is just JavaScript. 
And then it was also a bit easier to maintain things as every bit was kept in a nice and autonomous piece. Then as for disadvantages, there were a couple. We've added some complexity as because our, 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 our database was kept in a cloud and none of us ever did that before, but it actually runs smoothly. We had have some additional steps in deployment as we wanted to deploy each deploy it piece by piece. And at the end of the day, we also are aware that we have not have a chance to use all the industry standard software tools, like for example, Redux or Swagger. Now, I would like to hand it over to Ben, who's gonna to talk to you about some of the challenges we've encountered. Hi, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, some of the technical challenges uh, that we faced while creating the project. Um, I have to say that in general, we didn't face many challenges. Uh, and when we did, we were able to come together as a team um, and resolve them. So uh, first one being test-driven development, um, which we all know we need to do. Um, we could have done more TDD, um, but we tried to force some TDD in the early stages that actually ended up causing us uh, confusion and cost us some time. Uh, we've been very confident using the TDD approach in Ruby, uh, but had to think differently when testing the things like Jest and Cypress. Um, so another one thing was um, we wanted from the very beginning to take into account responsive design um, and we knew that we wanted our app to be used on multiple size screens, uh, but obviously none of us are here because we're UI um, or UX experts, so we had an additional challenge uh, to also come up with the designs themselves. Um, and here we just wanted to call out the sheer number of new concepts that we had to pick up um, and run with during this project. Um, just when we sort of started getting comfortable with Ruby's linear way of working, uh, we had to contend with asynchronous things like promises in JavaScript. Uh, React was also new to us. We had to learn about things like props and state. Uh, and finally, we had some fun and games uh, with cores uh, as our app relies heavily on obviously front and back end components talking seamlessly to each other. Um, uh, and that was fun. So I'm going to hand over to Melissa, who's going to actually demo the product. Thank you, Ben. Um, so this is our product. Um, it's obviously our finance page. This is the home page. Um, and as you can see, if we try and go onto any of the other tabs, we have to be signed in. So if we do a sign up and obviously enter an email and then our password, if the passwords don't match, then we will get an alert telling us that they don't match like so um, and then obviously just make sure that they do match and once we log in and we get a blank canvas for our spends expenses we have um, the money left this month which is our salary um, which we can update and yeah I'll pop on to one that's already been um, loaded so if I log in then we can see it where it's all kind of got all the information that we already need uh, so in doing this, obviously you can see it's all populated. We can go to our regular expenses and we've got our list there. We can add an expense like so um, and add a category, which it may be under, pop the cost in, and then it will be added to the list. And then this is where we can update our monthly income. Um, you know, high hopes here for 5,000 pounds a month. Um, and then that is all reflected back at the home screen here um, and we can go into our expenses we can update them we can change anything and we can also delete them and then they will disappear and this is all reflected in the overall amounts um, that are shown for the totals again we have it for spends uh, we can add a spend um, when we add them it has to be within the month that we are in and um, this is due to the archive that i'll go into in a moment um, and yeah, so then we can just add these and again, it will get added to the list that we already have. Um, we can go in, we can update them, we can delete them um, and it will again be reflected. In the archive, we can go into a different month and we can see where we've spent and what categories. And this is just done month by month in a nice bar chart. And then if we go back to the home page. We can just see our overall um, totals, money left this month, money left per day, and there's the roundup. 
And now I will pass on to Heather, who will do our retro. Hello. Yeah, so I'm just go basically just going to do a little sort of retro of the project. So um, if you can click for me a few times, thank you. So yeah, so I'm here to conclude. So under each um, photo we've got here, we've got a little sort of bullet point list of our sort of wins, our challenges and our future plans. So the team and I feel we worked extremely proactively on this. Um, our MVP was done in a, a few days with the original idea and that was thanks to planning sprints and obviously our development as coders. So as a little insight to the development of our code, we've brainstormed some extra features we'd love to implement, such as a welcome message, a barcode scanner, receipt scanner, and many more. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So overall, uh, Boost Finance has been a great way for us to finish our journey with makers. So hope you enjoyed it. Cool, thank you so much. A lovely, lovely presentation. Please uh, emote, emote to your, to your heart's content, emote as much as you possibly can, more than you've ever emoted before with those little reactions, whether they be party poppers or hands or hearts or anything you like really go for it cool thanks nice work okay um now the next team is going to be introduced by stefan over to you stefan hello um good to see you all um <clears throat> so the next team well what can i say um it's been a tricky time recently with coronavirus this year and this team have found a way to take out your frustrations and get your revenge on the evil virus um, they built an app using C Sharp and Unity. Um, so here I am to in uh, introduce the Unity team. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so we built a game called Rona Tower Defense. Um, it was developed by me, Jack, Sweezel, and Christian. Next slide, please. Um, our initial idea was to make a 3D rendition of the popular tower defense game, Balloons Tower Defense. Uh, for those of you who don't know how a tower defense game works, there's usually some sort of road or pathway which enemies will come down, uh, getting more and harder each round, and you put down towers or traps to try and destroy the enemies before they hit the end of the pathway. Um, the main idea behind the uh, Balloons Tower Defense copy was that none of our team had that much 3D modeling skills and balloons are quite easy to make. Um, probably one of the easiest shapes in the world. Next slide. And then after a bit of discussion, um, we concluded that balloons are really, really boring. And quite frankly, there's a similarly spherical shaped object, which is far more relevant. And that's where we got the idea to include a coronavirus. Right, so um, <clears throat> we had a range of towers that, that we designed to make them more relevant to our idea. So the first one is a pill turret, which shoots pills to cause damage. And um, then we have a vaccine launcher, which shoots exploding syringes. We also have a temperature reader, which is sort of a laser, which slows the little rowners down. Um, then we have the sanitizer lady. She looks slightly demonic, but we move. Um, she sprays um, hand sanitizer to do damage to the Ronas over time. And then uh, the best we've got is the Plague Doctor, and he throws exploding potions um, at the Ronas. So the towers, we uh, not the towers, the enemies, we have a variety of them, um, and they all have different properties. So like the speed they move at, the health points, sort of reflects the different strains of Rona personally really like the pink one because I designed it myself you know um and then lastly we have the boss which he is really difficult to defeat he's probably the reason we are still in lockdown um and you will encounter him in the last and final round if you make it to the final round cool so I'm just gonna uh speak talk about um well overall our gameplay uh, so as you can see, you can pick from a number of uh, different uh, weapons uh, and each weapon has a range. Uh, the range varies depending on which weapon you pick and also the damage increases or decreases on, you know, depending on which uh, weapon you have. Uh, once you do gain enough 
funds, uh, you can also upgrade each uh, weapon, uh, as you can see here. And you can also, you also have the option of adding more weapons to aid you uh, throughout each round. Uh, we also do have some background music playing um, and for both of the levels. And um, each enemy also uh, follows a number of waypoints. So the waypoints are pretty much kind of reference points for the COVID to follow. So they're laid out throughout the map and that's what we've laid out from the beginning point all the way to the hospital right at the end so that they can follow them, follow the path ne neatly. And yeah, as you can see, the, the enemies also speed in uh, varying speed, lives and uh, damage. I will pass this on to, uh, on to Jack. Thank you, Christian. Um, so we'll see in this round that it started getting a little bit more difficult now. Um, and the Ronas are starting to get a little bit further through the map. Um, on this round, we're, spoilers, going to lose some health. Um, which we reflected at the top of the screen. As they reach the hospital, our health goes down. Um, as we progress um, through the levels, we can also up unlock different towers. So we unlock the stronger ones at the later rounds. So we can now see that we're going to be placing down a vaccine launcher, which will explode on impact. Uh, we also saw an example a moment ago of deleting some of the nature that we have on the map. Um, this nature has been randomly placed at the beginning of each game, so it will be different each time you actually play it. Um, we saw the option to upgrade a tower earlier. We also have the option to sell a tower. So if you place it down and decide that you no longer want it, you can sell it and it will add the funds back to your money. Um, So now we'll be able to place down the last tower that we've designed, which will be the Plague Doctor, which has been animated to actually throw the potions when the Ronas actually pass his range. You can see an example of destroying the nature and upgrading again. So we decided not to put down too many towers for this round, um, just so you can actually get an idea about what would happen with the game over screen. Um, just to make sure that we didn't have to go through all of the rounds to show you how to actually win the game. Um, this wasn't the only level that we ended up designing. Um, once we've made the first one, it was quite easy to include all of the um, pre-made materials and make a second level, which we'll just demonstrate to you here. So it's a desert theme level with palm trees and cacti instead. And I will now pass back over to Dan. Uh, so I thought we'd just sort of talk about each um, uh, one thing that we enjoyed doing uh, or found interesting during the project. And that for me was writing the script for the hand sanitizer tower because she works slightly differently to the rest of the towers in that because she uh, her spray goes directly onto the pathway. Um, we had to make sure that when the player placed her, she was next to a road and also facing the direction of the nearest road. Um, and to do that involved a little concept called ray casting, which allowed me to sort of shoot an invisible ray in each of the four directions and figure out one whether there was a road within her range and to which direction I needed to turn and face her so that she was facing the pathway. Um, I also enjoyed working with the team. We had a really good communication, which made it really easy to divide our work and make sure we all stayed on the same track, even if we weren't with each other the whole time we were working. Um, I'll pass over to Jack. Thank you. Uh, I just thought I would go through what went well, what I enjoyed and what could have gone better. Uh, so I really enjoyed um, working on this script to actually place the towers on the map. Um, it was a really good way to display how to link Unity elements to the actual code that we had written. Um, and the way that we approached it meant that we could further adapt it later down the line to um, add functionality to our game. What went well, I thought the um, making the second level went really smoothly, a lot smoother than what I thought it would do. 
Um, we made prefabs, which work as blueprints um, so that we could reuse them in our first level, which meant that when we came to make the second level, we could just reuse and adapt everything that we already had. Uh, what could have gone better? When I was making the shop UI, uh, these blueprints were referenced multiple times. Um, this is bad practice, and, but I just didn't know how to resolve it. Um, but with the help of my team, they, ex they explained a new concept to me called scriptable objects, which helped me to resolve the issue and aided future functionality. And I'll now pass over to Christian. Uh, yes, so um, this game has so many features and I probably enjoyed working on the most boring part of the, the whole game, but uh, working on the UIs, um, I think overall I kind of um, grew an appreciation for uh, just, you know, UIs and the design and the animations um, of them. And um, yeah, I found that a little bit time consuming at first, but then after that I was able to create a um, template that I could reuse for the different levels um, and uh, yeah that kind of helped me to save some time later on uh, when we were developing the game. Um, also, I also thought that as a team we communicated very well. Uh, we often paired um, on individual tasks and we will always make sure that we understood the logic behind our code. Um. I really enjoyed working on the upgrading and selling functions for the towers. Um, like Jack mentioned before about the prefabs, I was able to use the prefabs of the original towers and just change bits like materials to make them look different and give them um, different properties like their range, the fire rate, damage they cause. Um, this also required me to work a bit on the UI, which allowed the user to sort of select their towers, have their different options available. Um, I was completely new to Unity, so there were moments where I didn't know particularly how to approach certain things to do. And so shout out to my team for being really supportive and always available to help me. Um, any questions for us? Well, ama amazing, lovely presentation, folks. Um, seems like you are open to having uh, taking questions. so. Um, if there's anyone in the audience with one or two questions, then totally feel free to uh, to uh, ask ask a question. Any questions? Or you could pop it in the chat if you like. Are you all? Are you all? Is cohort okay to ask questions? What's that? Sorry. Is any of the cohort okay to ask yeah, questions? Sure, go well? ahead. Yeah, if you want to. Um, so my question for the team would be, what was the most difficult thing to overcome during this two-week project? Nice question. Uh, for me, it was an experience with actually using the programs. So as we said, I was also new to Unity. I was new to learning C-sharp. Um, so it's quite a learning curve to go from no experience to actually being able to make the app work the way that it does. Um, but I really feel like that was drawing on the experience of learning previous languages, like what, the way we learned Ruby and our brief experience with Swift as well, really aided in being able to learn quickly and efficiently. Cool. Any other questions? We can probably do one more if someone has another one. If not, we'll move on to the next team. Oh, all right. Um, please, please do some do some emoting and show them some appreciation. Thanks, folks. Um, okay, so um, the next team is going to be introduced by Leo again. Back to Leo. Thanks, Eddie. So I make because we like to ask developers to do pair programming because it's better to learn and it's always more fun to code together than to be alone in front of your screen doing some coding. And I guess the next team was a bit more ambitious than that. They kind of asked themselves, why just limit ourselves to the makers community when we could, you know, pair programming with people all around the world and build things all together. Uh, and so now I'm going to leave them to present their pairing app project. Welcome to our project on creating a pairing app where new and experienced coders can create relationships, learning opportunities, and new skills. Our objective for this project was to develop our understanding of Java and its related frameworks. 
using our own experience going through the makers course, learning through pair programming, using our own insight to gain the most out of this experience. We did this by utilizing an agile development approach. Learning to program can be a lonely journey when you're starting out in this industry and can be very daunting for beginners. For those who have experience, it can be find hard to find others who are on the same level as you with similar interests in programming languages. Furthermore, it's a key agile development technique in software with employers and organizations seeking candidates to have experience in it, often showcasing professional and interpersonal skills. With this in mind, we create a platform where everyone can have the opportunity to have access to pair program experience. No matter their experience, beginner or professional, we'll match users with others based on their skill level and language preference to challenge oneself and most importantly, learn. Now I will hand you over to Duncan for our demo. Uh, hi guys, so this is our app. Uh, when you come here, first of all, if you're not logged in, you'll be redirected to this component where you can either sign up or log in. So I'm just gonna sign up a new user. Um, when I create the account, the so we're using JWT authentication. So when I create my account, I'll also automatically be logged in and I'll be sent a JWT, which will then be attached uh, to all future requests using an interceptor. Uh, so the backend can basically check that we are properly authenticated before giving us any data. Uh, so after logging in, you land on this homepage. It just explains a little bit about what the app is for and uh, directs you that the next thing you should do is uh, complete your profile so that we've got the data we need to pay you correctly. So let's head over to the profile. If you haven't completed your profile, you'll see this screen where you can complete it. So we ask you for your GitHub link so people can get an idea of the kind of projects you're working on. If you don't have a GitHub, you're directed to create one. But uh, as it is, you can just enter that. And then you can enter your experience level and the languages that you're interested in pairing on. And this is uh, this comes from the back end. So if we wanted to add more languages, we would just add them there. And then it's automatically uh, collected onto the front end. So I'm just going to choose some languages. Uh, and then I will submit my profile. And now the, the, the app knows that I've submitted my profile. So instead of showing me the form, it shows me my actual profile. Uh, I have the opportunity to become active or inactive. And that will basically decide whether I'm in the pool for pairing whenever matches are made. Because uh, obviously, we don't want people being matched with people who are busy or are not interested in pairing that week or that day. Uh, so we just have this button that you can toggle. Uh, so once I've done that, I can head over to the matches section. So I don't have any matches yet. Um, the exact implementation of this would depend on the use case. So for example, we could have an admin user that could be a makers coach that would have a button to create their matches each day. Or if this was in a wider scale, then you could ma make matches say every week, uh, similar to the like coffee and lunch apps that exist at the moment. But for demo purposes, we've just put this button here that will run our matching algorithm and automatically match me with the person that suits best. So I'm just gonna click that now. And see, I've been matched with Bob and uh, I can click on his profile to have a look and see what he's interested in. I could check out his GitHub. Uh, I can also see the language we've been matched on. So if you had multiple languages that you were interested in, it would let you know which one you're gonna be pairing with this person on. Uh, it tells me when the match was made. So if I had multiple matches here, I could know which ones were most recent, which ones are current. Um, the next thing I'd want to do is get in touch with Bob and work out a time that works for both of us. So I can click message. It will take us over to the message component where I can see I have a new message. Uh, I click that, and so this conversation is seeded with this ma uh, message that's automatically created on the back end um, and just tells people basically to get in touch with each other. So now I can just write a message to Bob. And then if I was to log out and log in on Bob's account, then I can head over and I'll see I've got a notification and I can see that message and I can reply and we can work out the time to pair together. Um, and yeah, currently that is how our app works. And I'm going to pass you over to Glindy to talk a little bit about our data model. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, like other teams, we also started off by thinking about what features we want to have in our MVP, which stands for uh, Minimum Viable Product. And we're thinking, okay, users, profiles, matches, and availability. And um, you can see here the green, what is written in green is basically the foreign keys. Um, we also know that like planning is important. So we thought, okay, this is how we're going to build it. And this is our data model. So, um, and, but then what we realized after, yeah, it's that um, the, what, the reality was much more complex or different from that. Like, for example, we don't even have availability here because we figured that for it's a not a ne super necessary feature and also other features are much more important than and easier to implement for the MVP or the uh, project. 
And yeah, and we learned also as well about uh, uh, relationships like many to one or many to many. And um, yeah, it's been quite, in well, one thing going from the simple idea at the beginning or like when we thought we had planned it to then this was that we encountered quite a few problems. Like every time we were updating, like adding columns or adding tables, then we had to like meet up again, everyone and uh, rearrange our, um, and like we were basically running up into program problems, uh, which makes for uh, another point for better planning and thinking about this quite well. So yeah, passing over to Zoe. Thanks, Kalindi. I'm going to talk a bit about the matching algorithm. This is the part of the code that takes all the users that are signed up to the service and puts them into pairs. It starts out with a giant list of all the users that are signed up and filters them through the set of criteria you can see on the screen at the moment to create the most optimal pairs possible. First, it looks for active users. As you would have seen in the demo, you can mark yourself as inactive if you're busy or away for a certain week and don't wish to be paired, so they'll immediately be eliminated from the pairing pool. Then we'll look at pairing the users with the fewest selected language preferences first. If someone only selects one or two languages, it might be harder to find them a pair in those specific languages than someone who selected maybe five or six, so we'll look at pairing them first. We're then going to make sure that the users we pair have at least one language in common, so that learning an entire new language isn't a barrier to the pairing experience. We're also going to try and pair users that haven't been paired together before so that people can make as many new connections with fellow programmers as possible. And when the matching algorithm is run, it will keep putting you with different people until you've paired with everyone and then it will put you back with the first person you're paired with again. Um, and we'll also pair users with the most similar ability rating in their selected language so they can have the most productive session possible and no one will feel out of their depth. I'm now going to pass over to Paula to talk about the next steps for the project. So what does the future hold? Um, we've got some ideas for functionality such as Canada implementation, match rating system and an integrating coding environment. Uh, some things that we've learned over over the last couple of weeks uh, is that communication and planning is definitely the key to ensure that we're heading in the right direction when developing um, a lot of features. Uh, how to connect back end to front end using React and how to create a project from scratch using Spring Initializer. Thank you so much for your time. We hope you really enjoyed our work. We'd love to hear your thoughts now. Have you got any questions or feedback for us? Oh, amazing. Thank you uh, so much for a lovely presentation. Um, it's another team that's happy to take a couple of questions. So if there's anyone in the audience or in the cohort that has a, has a question or two, um, uh, shout out or put it in the, put it in the chat if you want. Um, go for Why it. Java, I see. Um, we wanted to work on the pro uh, language we will use in our placements. So it was quite hard to start, but now we're slowly getting into it. Nice. I, have one, I have one question. I can have another. Um, what happens if there's an odd amount of people? Does someone get left out? Uh, yes, yeah, someone won't get paired that time, but then the next time the algorithm is run and the matches are made, it will be ensured that that person won't get left out again. <laughs> Thank you. That's kind of cool. Oh, yeah, nice. Really nice work. Thank you. Thank you, team. Um, uh, excellent work. So um, the next team is, is is one for me to introduce. Oh, yeah, please do like emote or clap or whatever. I already did a bit of that myself, so kind of uh, skipped over that bit. But, you know, do it. Go for it. Um, cool. OK, so now it's for me to introduce the next team. Um, I'm sure there's pl plenty of people in the audience who are um, in incredibly amazing at uh, teamwork. And those people will know that there is no I in team. Um, but did you know that all teams start with T? Not just the letter T, but the word T, T-E-A. Um, none more so than the next team, which actually teams with T. They've climbed T Mountain, which is actually a real place. Um, they have T on T Mountain. And they brought back more T-based puns than you can shake a spoon at. Um, so now I'll hand you over to Team Frugality to tell you about their app. Thank you, Eddie. Um, 
That was very well. I think I think my role of a tea pun. I think you came for that one. <laughs> Some strong ones there. Um, welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and fellow tea lovers. Let me introduce you to frugality. Let's get this party started. Our purpose: we are a group of tea lovers that want to spend more money on tea. Budgeting was not our cup of tea, so we created frugality. It's an app that really takes the biscuit. Frugality was the next generation expense management. It's easy to use. They say money doesn't grow on trees, but how about tea leaves? About us, <clears throat> around 12 weeks ago, we started this apprenticeship as junior developers with no solid experience in coding. And we were completely strangers in the beginning. Uh, and we got to know each other and we shared our knowledge and we learned together throughout the journey. And finally, we made a wonderful team. And this is our final project. Let me introduce my team, Frugality, Eunice Contour, Rihanna Stewart, and Hetari Don Santos from Financial Times, and Oli Kennedy, Grace Farron from Ford, and myself, Shabrinath from Base. Thanks, Sab. Um, so over the two weeks, uh, we developed our skills a hell of a lot. Um, we can see on the left here, we've got a visual representation of what we thought our skills were at the time. Uh, we can see communication is quite high, a little bit of HTML, a little bit of CSS. And then afterwards, we can see that JavaScript has absolutely exploded. Our EJS knowledge is great. Our CSS knowledge has improved a hell of a lot. But the biggest improver award goes to MongoDB. Um, I, for one, started the two weeks not knowing how NoSQL worked. I didn't even understand it. And now I feel like I could take it into my workplace, which is uh, really valuable. And I'll take that. Starting off as a team, we decided that our main goal was to deliver an amazing project. We wanted to learn and most importantly, have fun and be inclusive. So by doing that, we did daily standups, making sure if anyone faced any challenges, we'd be able to voice it and communicate it and mob it out. And we also had a little Trello board with we would follow our task and assign them to people. So uh, we did not plan uh, an ordinary journey for our users. Uh, we have a fantastic um, user experience and journey through our app. So we have an authentication journey whereby you would land on the page, um, have the opportunity to either sign up or sign in. Uh, we always recommend because it's a tea app. If you're a fanatic and you're creative, you can actually use a tea inspired name for your username, which is fantastic and will be very good for us. Um, once you've created your account, you go straight away to your login and you then land on the account which will allow you to see quite a lot of things and enjoy a really tea-tastic uh, experience on the app and once you've done that you can actually log out from the page and you will see that later uh, so our tech stack uh, it was a full stack uh, web app um, on the front end we used html css and javascript and that communicated with the back end, which was run on uh, Node.js uh, with Express. Um, then we used MongoDB. And to interface with that, we used Monk and Mongoose. And then to test drive the whole thing, we had Jest for our unit tests and Cypress for our feature tests. And it all worked really well. So in the past two weeks, we did face uh, um, some challenges with the database, CSS, the design passport, and the testing, and the progress bar. Um, with the progress bar, that was one of the most difficult challenges that we faced because we did use third party code. So what was challenging was that first we had to understand what the person's code was saying first. And we also had to try and merge our own code with um, the third party code. And um, but with patience and with the help from the team and the mentors, we overcame this barrier. Although we faced many challenges, what went well was a lot of things. By continuing to communicate, make a couple of jokes about tea and tea puns, we continued to mob it out. So if anybody had any challenges, we did struggle with the database. So we decided to work as a team and then we branched off and went off to do our own things. That's enough for me. Um, so I'll hand it over to Eunice now, who's going to do the demo. Fantastic. I did um, 
promise that I would um, show you guys the experience that you would have on our web page. And I will press that now. Can you see my screen? Fantastic. Um, so this is the uh, tea lovers page, uh, Frugali Tea. Uh, you have two options. You can actually sign up, you can sign in. So as I said earlier, I've already taken my spot. So I'm already signed in. I've got my details in the database. I can log in happily. So my username is this. It's creative, it's fun, and my password. And that takes me into my account. Now, this is a really, really good app if you want to make sure you keep an eye on your spending. So you're all welcome to um, ask us our details later. I'll share that with you. Um, so if you have a budget of a uh, thousand pounds, um, let's say you wanted to make sure that that thousand pounds go into uh, important things. You have different categories here, which you can put them inside and that would show you your outgoings and your net. Of course, we couldn't let you go without giving you a nice sepalicious tea fact. So every time you refresh your page, you get a nice little tea fact that you can go about your day enjoying, or you can even print it out if you want, have a nice little t-shirt, make it a bit more personal. Um, we have a progression bar here. It's fantastic. I'm visual, I like to see things. And so if I came here and I insert 200 pounds, I want to see that move. And so in my mind, I know that bar is going lower and lower. As you go further and further, the bar keeps moving. And when you hit a danger zone, it will start going red. And that means you need to start watching your money. But don't worry about that because we've got you covered. Um, inside the page, we do have a nav bar, which gives you other categories. We didn't want to present you just one page. We wanted to give you a full user experience. And so you have a transactions page. Um, we have already got some transactions here, but I'll just show you in case you just wanted to save that 300 pounds that's left on the other page. You could come here and say, save this, uh, how much? 300, you want to be able to use that maybe in January. Uh, you click on your savings because you've got different categories. You could also filter here to see what you're spending your money on. And I shall show you that later. Um, if you click on submit, that will go into your savings. But as I promised, I'll just quickly show you how you can filter. So if I click on tea, I can see that this month I've spent 200 pounds on tea. So that's maybe enough. Um, so I'll go into my savings account and it says that I'd saved 700. That's because I'd already saved uh, a few more quid because I didn't want to spend it all on tea. But this is a fantastic page. Just kind of help you keep an eye on what you're spending or how you decide to save your money. Um, we couldn't let you go without giving you an about page because we do love to hear from our tea lovers, quote tea lovers, I'd say. Um, obviously, we've all got our tea inspired name, so please do get creative when you use the app. Um, if you want to give us some more puns on tea, you are more than welcome. You can either contact uh, all six of us at the same time or you can choose which tea you prefer. We have an, a, a contact us page, which I'm going to share with you now. Uh, this is the page and I would let my uh, colleague uh, Grace take over this. So there we have it. There's frugality. Thank you for listening. I also appreciate all the tea puns in the Zoom chat. Thank you very much. I hope you had a terrific fun. Um, look out for our next app, Tranquility, <laughs> the app that calms. Are there any questions? Oh, thank you so much. Really, really lovely presentation. Awesome, awesome application. Uh, excellent, excellent work. Um, seems like they're also happy to take questions. So uh, if there are any questions in the audience or uh, from the cohorts, um, please go ahead. You can either type them or, or just ask them. Any ideas for future functionality? Um, yeah, we did have quite a few. So uh, during sort of the first few days we did some brainstorming um, and we thought um, it's on the mirror board sorry um, we did have we were thinking about doing a pie chart for the transactions so when you make a transaction you can get a visual representation of what your finances are going into yeah that was one feature very cool thank you nice nice question thank you any other questions
I think there are a few in the chat about how much tea we consumed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, we wouldn't want to give that away. I mean, <laughs> too many, <laughs> considering uh, Grace, I think you stayed up quite late putting our last page up, which meant you might have had a bit of tea to keep you going. I was having fun with the tea pan, so. Nice. Um, someone's uh, making a shout out to the people from FT as yes. well. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Cool. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, to continue our uh, com community based hosting, I'm going to hand over to Stefan, who will introduce the next team. Cool. Um, so this next team set out to create a game from the ground up using JavaScript. Uh, prepare to be transported back to those halcyon days of the late 80s, early 90s of gaming, introducing the JS Gamers team. Lovely. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shimani, and I am one sixth of the JS Gamers team. And this is our presentation on the game that we've built over the two weeks. It's basically a retro grid game with a games engine coded from scratch. And we creatively, as a collective, called it Moving Game. Next slide, please. So selecting the characters that helped put this game together, starting from left to right. Deborah, Joe, myself, Shimani, Nia, Adam, and Bupesh, AKA Bups. On the agenda for our um, presentation, we have how we managed to choose our project. It will take you through the tech stack that we used to help build our project. We'll run you through a few demos um, of different aspect, aspects of our project. And we'll also talk you through the, how we manage our project and our learning process throughout the two weeks. I'll pass you on to Adam, who will talk you through this next slide. So our additional idea to make a game was for Snake. And our minimum viable product was getting a character to be able to move on a screen and we'd be able to control it with our keyboard. But we managed to get that completed within the hour, so we decided to become a little bit more ambitious with our goal. So we first of all had a look at game engines which would already move stuff on the screen for us, or fire bullets, or whatever. But we decided to do it from the ground up because we wanted more of a challenge. The tech stacks we are using is Node.js, Express, and ProSQL. And to host it, we use Heroku which has had its limitations on the free plan because we're only allowed 20 connections at one time and no connection pooling. So the first feature we'll look at is the enemy movement. So we wanted to create the impression that enemies had a mind of their own. Um, so to do that, we uh, generated a random number between one and four and then assigned it to a direction. So this uh, seemingly gives an illusion that enemies are making a choice. And it also means that the user's experience is unique every single time they play the game. Okay. For the bullet function, me and Shamani paired together. And very quickly, we realized that this was going to be a, a complex task. So to help us, we broke things down to get the small things working. So for our very first step, we wanted to just get a bullet to just move across the screen. And after that, we started adding more complex functionality to where we're able to get a bullet to move in all directions, hit enemies and kill them, and obviously not go to the end of the container. And then if it hits a wall, it will disappear as well. So yeah. The laser is kind of like a special weapon and you can only use it once per, per round or per level. As you can see here, we've got a weapon wheel which you can cycle through with the numbers at the top of your keyboard. And it works by checking if the enemy is in the bounds of the laser, which has to be worked out every frame because as the laser moves, uh, we calculate all the other three coordinates and the boss takes three damage for every frame that it is inside the laser. So another key feature throughout the game involves impact and reaction. Um, so we wanted to create the impression that we have physical boundaries and incorporate real world physics. Um, so such as bullets disappearing on impact, um, objects are picked up and used by the player. And uh, we've also got solid ob objects such as doors and walls that can't be walked through. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so to make our player movement more dynamic, we basically opted to use sprite sheets instead of a static image. So this meant we were able to achieve it by using CSS keyframes, which would essentially cycle through a row of images at a specified speed, creating an animation, which would simulate the movement in different directions. We then assigned all these animations to a CSS class and referenced it in our player movement function corresponding to the relevant arrow keys. And we also use it for our teleporter machine, which you can see in the left-hand corner. Cool, thanks, Deborah. Um, so I'm gonna brief briefly discuss um, how we managed our project effectively to um, create our amazing moving game. Uh, so one of the first things we did was to create a Trello board. Um, so this enabled us to track and prioritize the tasks um, to complete for our minimum viable product. So that included things like getting the character to be able to move around the grid um, and spawning enemies. Um, and then we also created a list of the nice to have stuff. So that included things like designing different levels, um, implementing sounds and uh, special effects and being able to pick up different weapons, um, which we could then work on once the basic functionality was in place. Um, every morning we had um, a stand up and we had afternoon stand downs and we used these sessions to allocate and reprioritize our Trello tasks um, and discuss the progress um, against these tasks at the end of the day. But we also use this time to share our learnings, uh, review each other's code and also discuss any blockers that we were having and how we could overcome them. In terms of how we worked together on tasks, um, we initially did a lot of mobbing. So we all got together as a team to decide on the type of game that we want to work on, the functionality it should have, and the basic game design. Um, and then we did a lot of pairing throughout most of the Trello cards um, or worked in threes. Um, this meant that we could work on um, a number of different uh, tasks in the day and um, move at a steady pace. And finally, we also got to do a lot of individual work towards the end. So once we had the modular setup done, um, we all actually individually designed each level. So if you haven't had the chance yet, please do click on the link in the chat and you'll get to, um, if you do eventually get to the boss, you'll get to see all of our individually designed levels as well. Um, for our resources, we used a lot of YouTube, Stack Overflow, W3 Schools, our mentors. Damn. Sorry about the noise, guys. Hold on. Okay, and our mentors, and obviously our resident nerd, Joe. Yeah, really sorry about this. Um, no worries, it's okay. Yeah, and then I guess with our challenges, we were trying to like, a lot of times we were like getting in our heads with like the code and stuff. So it was very difficult to know what direction to go in. And then I think there was at a point we might have been handling a bit too much. So we always had to make sure to just come back and know how to break things down. So yeah, that's probably what we struggled with the most. So yeah. So with regards to the refactoring, we quickly found that we had a lot of code by the end of the first week. Um, but by spending some time making the JavaScript modular um, and splitting it out into classes, it allowed us to turn one level by the end of the first week into seven customized levels by Wednesday of the second week. Um, so as you can see, we've got a, a walkthrough of our entire game on screen. Um, I believe the link has been posted. So that's the end of our talk. Feel free to go and have a game. Uh, thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Cool. Thank you. A uh, really, really lovely presentation and a really fun game. I played it earlier and I uh, highly recommend it. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, and you can see they put a, put a lot of thought into building the levels and um, thinking about how everything fits together. Um, the team is happy to help take questions. So if anybody has a question, uh, again, put it, in the, put it in the chat or just uh, shout it out. Any questions? I really like the um, artwork at the beginning of all of you guys. Um, so who created that or where did you find them? Because I think that was really cool. You mean on the presentation? Yeah. Uh, uh, Deborah, do you know where that's from? That was a link you found, I think. Do you mean in this presentation? Yeah. Um, I think it was just, do you mean like the avatars? Yeah, it was on a website called um, Chibi Maker. I can send the link in the chat and you can have a play with it. Yeah, agreed, Gareth. The sound effects are amazing, yeah. 
and I, I also I love those sprites in the presentation. Um, any other any other questions? Cool. I have a question actually. Did you have to? Um, did you have to? Was the, did you have to kind of? Um, how, how did you? What did you have to modify, if anything, in order to kind of balance the difficulty and make it make get it right? With a, or did it just kind of work out all right from the start? With regards to what in particular? So um, maybe like the the extent to which the enemies move around, or the like the damage that your um, guns do when you shoot the boss, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if there's any built-in difficulty okay. between levels. I think the randomization on the boss um, makes it harder depending mm -hmm. on how many times you have a go because obviously it's different every time you play it. So if yeah. it comes towards you, you're more likely to die. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, right, so uh, um, we're on to the last team. Wow. Time has flown by, and it's me to introduce them. I get the honor of introducing the last team. Um, at this point, I'd like to draw your attention to, to something else, actually. Something like about, I'd like, to, I'd like you to think about how complicated it is um, putting these teams together. So in the, um, in the kind of the end of week 10, um, we do an exercise where we do this kind of like ideation session. People suggest ideas, and we put them into categories, and then everyone votes on which category of idea they want. Um, so when we put it, when we're putting together the teams, we have to take into account this preference for a category. Um, we also have to take into account the tech stack that people will use on placement and try and give people um, some exposure to that tech stack so that they can, you know, uh, feel more comfortable joining their team when they start placement. Um, and uh, we also need to take into account like any personal preferences that people express about who they want to work with. Um, some people have like formed really strong friendships within the group and maybe prefer to work with some people rather than others. And so it becomes kind of like a kind of like a puzzle, right? Trying to fit all these pieces together. And uh, it's quite a hard puzzle actually. And it's quite like, you know, we kind of agonize it over it, like creating draft teams and then like shuffling them around and then like shuffling them around and then shuffling around some more. Um, and it, it's, it's quite a hard puzzle to, to piece together. Um, the final team was made up of people that will go on to use Java in placement and some people that will go on to use Kotlin in placement. And I think some people that will go on to use JavaScript in placement. And so um, their tech stack, their tech stack is also kind of a puzzle. They managed to, they managed to create an app using all of these languages um, in a, like a really, really awesome kind of modular style. So some parts of the app are used, are created using Java, some parts Kotlin, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so it's su super impressive the way they've gone about doing that. And then from this puzzle within a puzzle, another puzzle emerges, or maybe like a set of puzzles, because with their puzzle stack, they've created an application that involves some puzzles. Um, so without further ado, this is the last presentation of the day, and it's Team Puzzle Stack. Well, welcome everybody to our game, the, um, the Last Escape. It's an interactive escape room game. Next. <laughs> um, so you're going to be locked in, a whilst locked in a strange room, you are constantly challenged to observe, think, guess and infer until you escape. An innovative escape game with a challenging and exciting puzzle experience with three levels to beat and a target audience of 13 to 99. It's guaranteed fun to play alone and with the family. And with no time limit, you can play it at your own pace. So we have six games hidden in the rooms. Spot the difference, Hangman, Picture Puzzle, Panagram, Adventure Time, and Sudoku. One of the first things we had to do, as Eddie was uh, talking about before, was to confirm what we were doing. So we decided to choose uh, explicitly both Java and Kotlin to be used to see whether or not we could combine them. And we used the Android Studio in order to generate that because it gave us nice feature functionality like uh, you can see on the left hand side there, the ability to use fragments and uh, link them using pictorial representation rather than coding. 
um, and also enables you to provide a, um, a project di directory that you can split up easily into the different functions. As we were doing this, we decided to make plug and play modules of the game so we can change the path if necessary, or even make it um, dynamic if, uh, for future activities. So in order to do that, we chose to use fragments and not activities. Activities are mainly focused on individual games and fragments for the navigating kite games. And as you see, that caused us some issues. Goku Puzzle was uh, tutorial initiated. Having never done it before, we decided to, um, for the majority of us, to work from a tutorial to gain experience and actually get our hands on to the coding and start working immediately. Um, the one that I chose, unfortunately, finished 75% of the way through the completion of the game, um, and with the last one ending with a Tenoido warning. So I hope the guy's all right. Um, but it did mean that I had to work on 25% of the the game, which um, I think was probably a good thing in the end. Um, it was activity. We moved it to my uh, fragment and loads of people are going to talk about that. I like the way that it produced an isolated um, uh, type of game. So you could keep the different elements separate, uh, like the view, the game and the back end view model to enable you to segment things easily and maybe use different technologies or other requirements as things change. Has some lovely features in it. Um, like the error detection, et cetera, you can see that all there. And it had a scale game board based on the display device because we tested on tablets and phones. As I said before, the ID really helped out in the um, production of the code and the maintenance and also the ability to integrate the different games and the languages. Um, enabled you to isolate things very easily on the left hand side and you've got the fragment pieces down below. It's all coding, it's all rubbish. Wait until you see the game, it's much better. So for the Spot the Difference game, um, I basically had to ensure that the on-click listeners were linked to both images so that no matter what you clicked on either image, it would be highlighted on both images and then um, it would only be counted as one um, selection. And for the anagram game, I like included heavy use of like visibility switches and Boolean statements so that when the light is on and you click on the clue, only a blank piece of paper is presented. Whereas when the light is off and you click on the clue, it actually moves you through to the anagram game whereby every correct word unlocks one padlock and then you can move on to the next room. So for my game, I created a Kotlin adventure-based text game I'm not a massive gamer, so I definitely found it beneficial to follow a guideline that kind of concentrated on the game logic, which then allowed me to, you know, focus on building my current skills and learning new ones. Um, as my game was multidimensional, it required me integrating both the activities and the fragment together, which proved to be proved to be very, very challenging, but very rewarding, like at the end. I also created um, an animated splash screen, which my whole team knows I'm quite obsessed with in Java, which in Java, which allowed me to just build on my understanding and apply the knowledge that I'd learned from making my game to integrate all the files. Next. <laughs> so for my part of the escape room, I decided to make a picture puzzle. Um, the aim of the puzzle is literally just you, you're faced with a, a scrambled picture and you want to uns unscramble it. Um, to get a clue to the anagram in Esther's room. Um, if you try to swipe off the screen, it will let you know that that's an invalid move, you can't do that. Um, so some of the main challenges that I face during this is there's a lot of outdated tutorials out there and some are like, you, you think it's only two years old, but no, it's like, it's, it, it doesn't work anymore. And you have to kind of have to troubleshoot and find out what like approach to take. Um, and one of, the biggest challenges I think, which all of us faced was converting our activities to fragments, um, which I think you will find out a bit more about in the demo as well. Cool, right, this is my part. This is the Hangman game. Uh, if you don't know what Hangman is, then I don't know where you've been, but uh, <laughs> it's pretty much, you guess the word, and if you don't guess it in time, someone gets hung. Um, so one of my biggest difficulties was converting the activity to a fragment, which I think our whole team kind of had an issue with. 
um, especially in Java, because obviously you followed kind of the Kotlin way of converting it, but in Java it's kind of it, it was a bit harder to find, so we ended up kind of coming together to uh, to get past that. Uh, on the right, you can see when you get the word right, I've got a congratulation message, and when you get it wrong, there is a try again uh, pop up that you have to uh, obviously do all three stages again. Um, let's see, let's look. Cool. We have the demo now, um, which we'll just talk you through some of the stuff, some of the features. So um, I'll just quickly add over here, this is the navigation part. These are the fragments I was talking about earlier. And um, yeah, but go on, let's so take it. That's okay. This is the spot the difference. So it's literally a quick spot the difference with six differences. And when you get it, you do get the combination for the safe that you can enter to move past this room. Um, here, if the light is on, as I said, um, the piece of paper is blank and then you need to complete other games to get some clues. Uh, yeah, so this is my hangman game, uh, as you can see. So you guess one letter at a time and when you get it wrong, oh, okay, uh, it might take quite a while because there's a... Uh, quite a lot of chances oh, there you go um but the image updates every time you guess because there's like a counter that goes up and it will go to the array and it will select the picture that is the same number as the array and that will change the picture every time you enter uh, when you win obviously you get that congratulation message and it will take you on to the next round each round the length of the word increases um just to kind of make it harder make it a bit more interesting and obviously there's a selection of random words there as well. Um, just so it doesn't get repetitive if you play it more than once. Uh, I would have chosen better pictures, but obviously, oh, I better stop talking. Hang on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is just a demo of my picture puzzle, um, the swipes, and you wanna get the penguin at the end who will give you the clue to um, the theme around the words in, in the anagram game. Because we realise it's going to be very, very difficult if we just give you a bunch of random words and you don't know what you're doing and where to start. Because we struggled a lot with it, to be honest. So I'll just, there we go. So there's the theme, which is light. And then you can go back to the room and continue with the game. So now if you turn the light off and click on the paper, you get to the anagram puzzle. Um, and like Fabi has said, the theme is light. So it's like light and darkness. And every time you get a word right, you see one of the padlocks unlocked. So it's just from a word bank with words to do with light. And then when you get the final word, um, all three padlocks are unlocked and then you can actually go to the next room. She's where you can see my adventure game. If you see, if you try and not, if you don't follow the steps, you can die and it takes you back to the beginning of the game. So there is, I guess, steps you have to take in order to become powerful enough to, you know, get through all the stages and make it back, you know, to escape, escape this part of the escape room. Sudoku is a standard Sudoku one. Um, you can put it in, if you put a uh, wrong number in, it shows you where you conflict. So you know that it's wrong number. It does enable you to put notes in. Um, so you can put in, uh, you can't really see on that size, but uh, small numbers to indicate um, the, the opportunities you think it is. And considering the number of times that I had to run this in order to do it, I've now memorized all those number. And I sometimes wake up in the morning counting them. <laughs> Once it completes, um, it gives you a button like so to continue on the game. You've escaped. The play again button just takes you back to the beginning of the game. And eventually it will take you, you know, to higher levels and new games. Any questions? Cool. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, team. Really, really impressive application and a really lovely presentation, too. Um, again, uh, if there's any questions from the audience or from the cohort, please go ahead and ask them. In terms of your learning journey, if you had to do it um, over again, what would you do differently? Um, definitely start making it as fragments initially rather than trying to convert it after, I would say. 
definitely. Uh, it would, uh, having it done from the beginning in fragments would have made it a lot easier. And I think it would have made it more dynamic as well. We found out afterwards that if we um, use fragments right from the beginning and the fragment manager that's built into it, we could have maintained the game state and made it a lot more dynamic between the puzzles. Cool. Uh, Reese is asking about how you tested it. Did you do some testing? What a lovely question, Reese. Yeah. <laughs> <I thought> so. <laughs> um, there was a bit of testing. It was more of the um, functions that actually go behind the game. So, for example, like for my anagram game, returning a random word or returning a scrambled word and making sure it had the same characters as the correct word, for example. So it was more about the functions behind the game logic rather than the actual features of clicking on things on the game screen. I believe Gareth called it, was it development driven? Behavioral driven. <laughs> That's it, behavioral driven development. <laughs> As you can tell by the way that we know the game so well, et cetera, we have had to repeatedly test it. Virtually every line of code change, et cetera, always drove us to change the game so that uh, to actually run the game so that we could see the actual user behavior function. That's what that's what our testing was based on. I've just seen a question that says Java or Kotlin. I think I may be a bit biased and say Kotlin. I second that. Yeah. <laughs> Java is a great language, but I think because Kotlin is newer, it just takes everything Java has and it incorporates like new functions, methods, makes everything a bit quicker, nicer to code with. You know, we don't hate Java. We just we just like the new and improved Kotlin a bit better. Yes, we do, Paris. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely do. Nice. All right. Thank you, team. Uh, please give them a, a, a round of reactions with your little emoti, emoticons and whatnot and clap your hands, stamp your feet, uh, <laughs> all, that, all that kind of good stuff. Wave yeah. your hands in the air. Cool. Thank you, folks. Um, so that was our final presentation, but I'd like to give uh, one more round of appreciations to the whole cohort who've done a really, really stunning job today, um, but also to Stefan and Leo, who have uh, put in some really excellent work supporting the cohort over the last five weeks or so with, uh, with me. So I was, I was, I've been with them for the whole 12 weeks, but Stefan and Leo were sort of newer additions to the team. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to particularly appreciate them. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, really, really, uh, really, really well done. Uh, really awesome working with you. I think we should thank the coaches as well. I know we didn't, we didn't always make it easy for them and they, you know, they always tried their best. So it's been a good experience. Thank, thank you, you, Paris. Thank you, Paris. I appreciate that. That's very thoughtful of you. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it's been, been really, really amazing working, working with you all as a, as a cohort. Um, I'm, I'm sure that like everyone is blown away by seeing what you've done. Um, and uh, I guess I would just like to, to highlight something that is, although although there's a lot of a lot of we do cover kind of a lot of stuff explicitly at Makers, um, there's a whole ton of stuff that has gone into these applications that we haven't covered explicitly. Um, so, for example, when Paris has gone to pick up Kotlin, she's gone to she's, she's done that like entirely of her own accord. Um, people using Unity have picked up that of their own accord. There was people using the Mern stack. They've picked up Mongo like completely on their own, and so and that goes basically for like everyone in all of the teams. They've all they've all kind of got to the point now where they can they can be like, okay, I want to learn this new thing, and they go away and do it, um, and that's super super impressive. So if you now kind of think back to the things they've done and take that into account, it's even more mind blowing. So really 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 well done. Um, cool. Well, I think that's that's basically it. I, I really look forward to seeing what these people go on and do now after the boot camp, and um, I hope that you'll you'll keep in touch. It's been given the given the the, the pandemic, it's uh, it's been a fully remote cohort, so um, we've not met each other in person. But I hope that we will meet each other in person one day. Um, I will I will look forward to to doing that. Um, hopefully, we'll be back on site sometime next year. And you'll be able to come in to, to make us HQ, play a game of table tennis with me um, and do your knowledge module or something exciting like that. Um, so I look forward to that. And of course, um, I really I really want to thank all of the guests that have come along today. Thank you everyone who came along uh, in, in, thank you everyone for coming along. 
Um, and uh, I hope that we will see you at the next demo day. Thank you.